this is going to be fun. I am genuinely looking forward to this. I think that we are going to have a riot. What I'm going to try and do on this video is compile a Premier League team of 2022-2023. Look, it's not going to be easy, but I think that it can be done. And there is no correct answer. That is the beauty of this. This entire segment is completely and utterly subjective. So, before we get into it, I have a quick favour to ask you. Would you please consider clicking that subscriber button? It would be my honour to welcome you into this community. I think this video is going to be a really, really interesting ride into how the season has panned out and how I believe it's panned out. Some people, when they create their team of the season, will do it based upon things like XG and... Uh, Things that are very difficult to argue with. The statistics of the game, that is not how it will work on this here channel. On this channel, it will be based firmly up on the eye test. Players that I know are good. I'm not interested in what the statistics tell us. I'm not interested in the XG of the player. I can quantify a good footballer through my own mince pies. So bear with me. Certain things the XG cannot do. The XG cannot, for example, quantify spirit. It cannot quantify heart. It cannot quantify effort. It cannot quantify belief. And those sort of attributes are things that I believe have a huge importance in our wonderful game. So this should be fun. Remember, this can never be conclusive. It's a fun exercise. Let's enjoy it. And please click subscribe and let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Right, the only place to start is the goalkeeper. I promise you that I've been given this position the due diligence that it deserves. There are some outstanding contenders and I think I will start with some honourable mentions. I think the first keeper that I would like to mention is Aaron Ramsdale. Aaron Ramsdale is not my selection, but I think he has a fantastic season. I think he's been a top player for Arsenal. I think he has been part of the reason that Arsenal have launched a serious bid for the title and he has elevated the entire club. There were a lot of doubters and a lot of naysayers when he landed at Arsenal, but he has proved them wrong. His shop stopping, truly fantastic on various occasions. Away at Tottenham Hotspur, man of the match. Away at Anfield, man of the match. I think he is truly a top goalkeeper and his distribution is unreal. I think that you can now genuinely make a case for him being England's number one. In fact, on that note, I think I should mention the incumbent to England's number one, Jordan Pickford. I think Jordan Pickford has also had a tremendous season. And if Everton do indeed manage to stay up, it will be because of the contribution of Jordan Pickford. He is Everton Football Club. He is the personality. He is the fan on the pitch. He is the heartbeat and he is the public face of that club. And remember, Everton are a true Football Heritage Club. They are a tremendous football team. And overall, I think it will be a sad day if they do go down. Jordan Pickford has led that club with pride, with passion, and has been one of the very few players at that club to do it the service that it deserves. But neither he is my selection. Leno's had a good season. Emiliano Martinez has had a good season. But it was between two for me. It was between David Rea and Alisson. And I have gone with Alisson. I think he is a top performer. I think he is a great of the game. And I think he is iconic for Liverpool Football Club. The way that he conducts himself is an example to every single footballer out there. And I don't think he's put a foot or a glove wrong. A phenomenal season from him in what was a very trying season for his club. You know, the consistency, the shot stopping, the utter professionalism. He is everything that you want in not only a goalkeeper, but in a professional footballer. I think you could argue that he's the best keeper in the league. Edison may disagree, but I would argue it was Alisson. But even on their incredibly high standards that they set one another, I would say that the season goalkeeper of the year is Alisson. But an honourable mention to David Raya. Incredible season from him. And I hope Chelsea sign him. So next up is right back. And I feel like I need to put a disclaimer out early in this segment. I will not be picking John Stones as the best right back in the league this season. I totally concede that he is a remarkable player. And the way that Pep Guardiola has moulded him into this very particular, wonderful, brilliant player that can be utilised in various different roles, often from right back, is incredible. And England will benefit so hugely from Guardiola's intelligence. However, he is not the best right back in the league. And I know that a lot of people will be annoyed with me here, but I'm not prepared to pick in there. I've been thinking about this a lot and I will not put John Stones as the best right back in the league. I think he's exceptional and I think on some level he probably is being harshly treated by me. But 
I just can't do it. I'm sorry. So I've been really thinking about the players that have been the best right back. And I've decided to start with some honourable mentions. I think Aaron Wan-Bissaka has improved massively under Eric Ten Hag's coaching. And if he continues in the vein that he is, I think he could have a big future at Manchester United. They are words that I didn't think I could possibly say this season. But Wan-Bissaka has been exceptional and Eric Ten Hag deserves an awful lot of credit for that. But again, he will not be my selection. Apparently, somebody on social media was telling me that I must mention Serge Aurier here. Uh, I'm not prepared to do that. He certainly does not get a mention in this segment. No mention for Serge Aurier. Trent Alexander-Arnold in the hybrid role has been quite decent, but I'm afraid overall his season has been fairly underwhelming. Ditto Reese James. And thus, we are left with three. Kyle Walker is a truly elite player. A great of the game. One of the best to have ever played in his position. I think he is truly exceptional. His trophy hall guarantees that theory. And I think that he is probably the best player in that position. That does not mean, though, that he has had the best season. I think that Carl Walker's pace is amazing. His awareness, his willpower, his willing, his tenacity, he is sublime. But in terms of the best contribution to their team this season, I'm not going to be picking him. It's between two players. It's between Ben White, who I am also not going to pick to the wrath, I'm sure, of a lot of Arsenal fans. I think Ben White has been truly brilliant. He is a force up and down the flank. And he has reached a level that I did not think he were capable of reaching. He has been a huge part as to why Arsenal have been such a potent force this season. But I'm afraid Kieran Trippier gets my vote. I think that Kieran Trippier is responsible for elevating Newcastle United, elevating the belief at Newcastle United. Every single move that he has made in his career has been for the furtherance of that team. He is the experience. He is the world-class player in that team. And I think that he deserves to be the anointed right-back of the season. Right, over the other side, let's go to left-back. I think there are some standout candidates here, but my selection is going to be slightly left-field, I think. I will acknowledge the contribution of Ben Chilwell. Whenever he is fit, Chelsea look like a far better team. Nathan Ake, I mean, if we're doing this in some way, you could just name the Man City team. And obviously Nathan Ake has had a wonderful season over at left back, but he doesn't get my vote either. I think Luke Shaw has played very well. But again, this comes down to two players for me. It comes down to Zinchenko and it also comes down to Esther Pinion. Let's remember... When Cucurella left Brighton, it looked like Brighton were in turmoil. How would they ever replace their player of the year from the previous season? Chelsea had come in, hijacked their main man, and they were going to be left ragged down that side. That has not happened. Esther Pinion is a better player than Cucurella. And I think his season is almost a microcosm of Brighton's season. A player that's come in with relatively little fanfare for exceptional value at £15 million and has elevated his own performance to that of certainly a Champions League level. That is totally applicable to Brighton. The story of Esther Pinion is the story of Brighton and Hove Albion. And they are an amazing club. They are the best run club in the country and they deserve nothing but praise. Tony Bloom, De Zerbi, I'm in awe of both of them. But the best left back this season has been Alexander Zinchenko. It may have gone off the boil for Zinchenko. It may have faltered at the last hurdle. But if you think about his contribution to Arsenal over the whole season, obviously focusing on Arsenal's last six, seven, eight games, it's easy to be fairly sneery about what I'm saying. But over the course of the season, Zinchenko was often the personality of that team. He was often the catalyst for victory. He was the experience. He is a winner. He knows what it takes to win massive games. Look at their performance against Manchester United when they beat them at the Emirates. A victory that actually signified that they were capable of winning the league. It was a victory that you could see he was taking personally. A former Manchester City player playing against Manchester United, beating Manchester United in the most dramatic circumstances possible. It mattered to him. And I think one of the main reasons that elevated everything at Arsenal, not only the performances, but the things that are very difficult to quantify, the belief, the personality, the fight in the team, the heart in the team, I think that was quite often down to Zinchenko. He goes in as my left back. Right, we go to the centre-halves. Now, a lot of this video is going to be subjective. There's going to be opinions. There's going to be debates and people are going to be generally annoyed with my selections. But these two, the two centre-half positions, are so easy. 
I'm sure, 100% sure, in fact, that we are all in agreement. There is almost zero jeopardy. Everybody will agree that there are two standout centre-halves who go into a team of the season. Correct? This is going to be absolutely fine. I'm going to start with some honourable mentions. Of course, I'm going to talk about Thiago Silva. In a season when Chelsea have collapsed, in a season when Chelsea players should be hanging their heads in shame, in a season when almost none of these players are fit to wear that esteemed shirt, that badge upon their heart, Thiago Silva is a breath of fresh air. He is a true great of the game. He is the best player in his position of his generation. And it is a travesty that Chelsea have cut his Champions League career short. I love the man. Of course, I'm not making a case for him being since half of the season, but I truly love the man. I think we should obviously talk about Lissandro Martinez, his qualities, his impact at Manchester United. And we have to also acknowledge Eric Ten Hag's bravery in bringing him in. To drop the Manchester United captain to bring in his own man. People were saying that he was too short to play the game. And I took that personally. I believe that Eric Ten Hag does deserve an awful lot of praise here because the easiest thing for him to have done would have been to sit and hide behind Harry Maguire's big loaf of bread. Just hide. You didn't sign him. He's the £80 million man. He's the captain. And any mistakes that he makes will never be on Ten Hag's shoulders. Instead of that, Ten Hag brought his own man in. And therefore, any mistakes would have been a poor reflection on Eric Ten Hag. But he made the correct call. And Lissandro Martinez, his tackling, his ruthlessness, his energy, his aggression has been massively missed by Manchester United. Levi Colwell has had another great season and I think his promise is totally undeniable. I really want to see him back at Chelsea and I really want to see him starting games for Chelsea. Zven Botman probably deserves a mention here. I can't believe I'm saying this. Maybe even Tyrone Mings. But let's be real. Two standout candidates. And in fact, they're not even candidates. There are two obvious, correct answers. The main men are William Saliba and Ruben Diaz. This one is non-negotiable. I don't need to go into it. This is just fact. William Saliba, his injury coincided with Arsenal's capitulation and Ruben Diaz is arguably the best centre-half in the entire world. They are a credit to their team. Their professionalism is unreal. And without them, if you were to subtract these two players from their teams, the trajectory of their clubs would be very different. They are outrageously good. Just look at Saliba's composure. The way that he plays the game is so impressive. He allows Gabriel to attack the ball and he sits back. He makes defending look easy. His interception skill, unreal. His distribution, so comfortable on the ball. And he is one of the main reasons that Arsenal were able to propel their way up the league. And sometimes you can see quite how good a player is by how their team cope in their absence. As soon as you removed William Saliba from that Arsenal team, Gabriel looked half the player. Rob Holding wasn't fit to deputise and Arsenal slumped. That is the importance of William Saliba, undoubtedly in my team of the season. And Ruben Diaz, I mean, you run out of superlatives for a player like this. You know, he is Mr. Reliable for City. And let's think about it. Very intelligent from Pep Guardiola. We always focus on Pep Guardiola spending money. We always focus on Manchester United's ability to outpunch anyone financially. But Ruben Diaz wasn't there. Where was the cue from Europe's elite clubs for Ruben Diaz? I think we have to give Pep Guardiola huge amounts of credit here because they bought in Ruben Diaz. And at the time, nobody was particularly fussed by that. And they turned him into one of the best defenders in the world. He keeps Laporte out of the team. He is a true great he sets the standard. He demands so much from himself and those around him. And these two are just exceptional. Head and shoulders above everyone else. Now, in my formation, I don't want to hear any pushback. I don't want to hear any back chat. I'm going for two holding midfielders, partly because I think two need to be selected, partly because I think it's good balance for a team. But also, I just think there are two standout players in this position that need to be in a side. I mean, the obvious one to start with, right? Should we do the obvious one and then we'll go on to debate the second one? Rodri. Rodri is obviously in. His majestic patrolling of that midfield, his blocking, his energy, the goals that he can score, curling one in in Europe with his left foot. He is elite. And how they have managed to go from Fernandinho into Rodri is a testament to the scouting network and coaching abilities of Pep Guardiola. The geezer averages 80 passes a game. Do you know how integral that is to Pep Guardiola in the way that he plays football? He is the metronome of the team. He is the personality of the team. He is the heartbeat of the team. 
And I'm so envious. So, of course, Rodri is in my midfield. It now comes down to who plays alongside him. And this has not been easy. The due diligence that I've given it has made it almost impossible because I still have four standout candidates. I've tried to be ruthless. I've tried to be uh, decisive, but I have found it very difficult. I've still got four and I am still just about working it out. I do have a standout candidate, but it is not easy. I'll start with talking about Casemiro. He surprised me. He has surprised me. He has been a revelation in that club and he is everything to Manchester United. As soon as he's not in the team, they look like a shadow of their former self. And as soon as he's in the team, they look capable of beating anybody. Now, look, I'm going to level with you. I don't watch much football from other leagues. So the most I'd really watch Casemiro was when he was playing for Real Madrid in the Champions League. And since he's arrived in the Premier League, he's basically not the player I thought. I didn't realise that he would have such a vast array of skills at his disposal. The goals that he scored, the passing, the range of passing, the short passing, the long passing. Like I think when he was playing in a midfield with Tony Cruz and Luka Modric, maybe he was underrated, maybe he was under, underutilised. But I've never really seen him as a goal scorer, but he's scored some really important goals for Manchester United this season. Obviously, recently, obviously at Chelsea. It's... Uh, it's been one of the signings of the season for sure. But does he make it? Next to discuss, we're going to go for Declan Rice. You know, a majestic, imperial, awesome footballer who's clearly worth over £100 million and will be playing in the Champions League next year. He is probably the reason that West Ham United could plant their flag in European soil. West Ham could win a trophy for the first time since 1980, since Frank Lampard's father was winning silverware for West Ham United. That could change, and one of the main reasons it will change is Declan Rice. Look at his performance fairly recently against Arsenal. He bossed the midfield. He changed the game. He bossed the midfield against Thomas Partey, Granit Xhaka, and Martin Odegaard, with basically no support around him. Declan Rice is sensational. We've seen it for England. We've seen it for West Ham. And this season, although there have been times where perhaps it's been slightly underwhelming for him, he is carrying a club the size and stature of West Ham United. That is elite. And I think he is going to make it. But it's not definite. Thomas Partey has been fantastic this season, but has gone off the boil of late and therefore does not make it into the reckoning, leaving only Caicedo as an option. I think Caicedo has been fantastic. But when we are talking about the creme de la creme, I think the future is so big for him. I would love for Chelsea to sign him. I think we're so in need of a player of his qualities. But Caicedo doesn't quite make it. I'm torn between Rice and Casemiro. And I'm going to give it to Declan Rice. The midfield is Rodri and Declan Rice. So attacking midfielders. Now, I thought creating this segment, a team of the season that we could do, was going to be fun. But it's giving me a migraine. It is so difficult because... What I want to do in this segment really is talk about some of the some of the most glorious players this season, players that I've enjoyed watching. You know, James Madison, for example, Eberich Eze, but we can't because there are some elite players and we have to focus on them. And it's so tricky. It's like Sophie's Choice. I don't know what to do. It's almost impossible because I have distilled the best attacking midfielders in the Premier League and I have managed to work out that there are five. Five. I have two spots available. I have to leave out three elite footballers. I have to leave out three dazzling footballers. Three footballers who have given us nothing but joy and amazing moments this season. Three of them have to be left out of this team. So here goes. So the three players that I am reluctantly leaving out of my team of the season are... We'll start with the jewel in the crown that is being left out. Bernardo Silva. I believe that any team should be able to accommodate Bernardo Silva. I believe that Bernardo Silva is one of the most majestic footballers in the Premier League. I love him. It's very rare for me to love a player who doesn't play for Chelsea, but I genuinely love Bernardo Silva. He is everything that I want from a midfielder. He's everything that I want to be when I play football. So comfortable on the ball, works so hard, tenacious in a tackle, silky on the ball. He is perfection. Utter perfection, an awesome player, a grandiose player, but just magnificent. But Bernardo Silva, despite the fact that I believe he is in line for a Ballon d'Or, 
despite the fact that he is one of the most poetic footballers, the definition of silk, he is left out of this team. Alongside him, <laughs> Bruno Fernandes. I have no choice but to leave Bruno Fernandes out of this team. Another remarkable season from Bruno Fernandes. He has been a sumptuous playmaker for Manchester United. He has made them tick. And the reason why they could win two pieces of silverware and finish in the top four is largely due to the contribution from Bruno Fernandes. But I just can't find room for him in this team. He's been a joy to watch this season, Bruno Fernandes. I think he's quite unpopular. I think people perhaps don't like him and therefore don't acknowledge his contribution. But Bruno Fernandes is an elite level footballer tip top and belongs certainly in this company but possibly belongs in a team of the season he just doesn't quite make it into mine neither does Ilkay Gundogan sumptuous playmaker beautiful footballer scoring big goals been doing it and doing it and doing it well for years but again I have to leave him out because I have to find room to accommodate Kevin De Bruyne of course Kevin De Bruyne is in my team an astonishing 16 assists and seven goals. And he is midfield perfection. The reason why he has to be in this team is because I believe that Kevin De Bruyne has managed to change the conversation. A conversation that has been set in stone for years. When discussing the best midfielders in the Premier League era, people have a list. And the list is non-negotiable. What Kevin De Bruyne has managed to do is change the list, change the perception and change the conversation. Back in the day, it was always Lampard, Gerrard, Scholes, Vieira Keane. That was it. I believe that Kevin De Bruyne has managed to muscle his way in to that crew, that elite crowd. And the way that he has played this season, his contribution to Manchester City, where would they be without him? Where would the rest of the players be without him? He is in my opinion, the most naturally two-footed player that the Premier League has ever seen. I can't think of anyone who has scored as many goals with their weaker foot as him. Look at the goal that he scored against Arsenal. That delicate lob, one touch, left foot, over the keeper, into the back of the net in the biggest game for them this season. A huge player, a wonderful talent, and of course, he makes my team of the season. Partnering him just, just makes it ahead of the players that we've already mentioned. I had to acquiesce to leaving out. It's Martin Odegaard. An amazing season. A truly amazing season. You know, the goals, the guile, the strong leadership, constantly hungry, so creative. He has had an amazing season. He's been constantly committed. He has been just forever the personality of that team. He is the metronome, the heartbeat, and the goals speak for themselves. You know, his playmaking at Arsenal has been a joy to behold and he has scored 15 goals he's got seven assists and the elegance with which he does it the goals from range and he has been a thorn in Arsenal opposition side from day dot remember when he scored two goals very early in the season against Bournemouth he's never looked back the two midfielders are Martin Odegaard and Kevin De Bruyne and up front we just go straight into this, eh? Haaland and Kane. It is Haaland and Kane. There's no debate about it. I think that the pair of them have been exceptional this season. Erling Haaland for many, many obvious reasons. The goals, the volume of goals, the consistency of goals, the variety of goals, the goals, the goals, the goals. Erling Haaland has broken all sorts of records. He has redefined what a striker should do. And who knows how his career will end up? How many goals is he going to end on? He's going to win on 500 goals or something ridiculous. He is born to do it. He is the Craig David of the goal-scoring world. And of course, Erling Haaland leads the line. Alongside him is Harry Kane. Harry Kane has had an exceptional season. And the fact that he has done it while surrounded by dross, whilst the club have been in crisis, whilst there has been mismanagement at every single level, whilst those around him have shrunk. Where was Son? Where was Richarlison? Where was Kulusevski? Nowhere to be seen. Harry Kane is carrying Tottenham Hotspur on his shoulders. He is outrageously good. And I like Kane. And I think he needs to get out of that club. He is unbelievable. His dedication to the craft. He is a role model. He is truly, truly a great of the game. And the sooner that he gets out of Tottenham and gets to a proper club where he can win some silverware, the better. The fact that these two have scored so many goals, I think, sets the bar. They have redefined what being a goal scorer is all about. 
Uh, it's been an honour to watch them both play. And it has to be these two. That concludes my team of the year. I really hope that you like it. What I haven't done here, I haven't been cowardly. I haven't said this would be my subs bench or anything like that. I've given you my 11 players. You know, the easiest thing to do would be to say on the bench, I would have Jack Grealish or Mo Salah or whatever, but I'm not doing that. I'm saying these are my 11 players. This is my team of the season. I would love to know your thoughts on it. Do you think this is the correct team? Is there anyone that I've left out? Is there anything that deserves mention? If there is, please let me know in the comment section below. And as always, thank you for watching this video. Please do click subscribe. And if you've enjoyed this style of video, please give it a like. Have yourselves a wonderful night. Thank you so much for watching in a bit.